Has your search for fulfillment and acceptance led you to settle for the meager offerings of a society that is too insecure in itself? Or are you willing to push past the crowds and reach out for a life whose very touch can transform everything? Hey Church, it is so good to have you with us today for a brand new season of Church Online here at C3 Yorks. Today we're kicking off with a brand new series called The Questions Jesus Asked. Thank you for joining us today. Do say hi in the comments and let us know where you're watching from and who you're watching with. And if you'd like to connect with us or you want to ask for some prayer or just find out a bit more about our church, then head to c3yorks.church forward slash connect and uh, you can get in touch with us there. And of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell on YouTube so that you get a notification whenever we drop some fresh content. Uh, For all of our regulars uh, watching, we're changing things around a little bit. We've got some worship coming up after the message today, because right now we're going to dive straight into today's message called Who Touched Me? Uh, This is as part of our new series called The Questions That Jesus Asked. Uh, Let me read to you today from Mark chapter 5 verse 21. I'm going to read a bit of a story. So uh, if you're sitting comfortably, I will begin. Mark chapter 5 verse 21 says this. When Jesus had crossed again, uh, had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was uh, by the lake. And then, and one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. But she thought, if I just... Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus said to him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing uh, loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion? Why all the wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him and he put them all out. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and he went in to where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. For those of you who are new here, myself and my wife Gosha have two children. Actually, we've got one teenager, Anya, and one adult, Joel, as he turned 18 back in April. And they're both amazing. We love them to bits. Uh, Looking back, one thing I'm glad that we did deliberately from the day they were born was to try to normalize intimacy within our family. We did this because we wanted them to grow up in a space where they would feel comfortable to be honest about their feelings, as well as have a place in which they would know that they are loved. And we did this in a couple of ways. Firstly, we would regularly say, I love you, or just like, love you, 
to each other, uh, which means even to this day, as one of us is heading out, you know, if heading out the front door, we'll, we'll normally throw a love you at each other as we say goodbye. And, and you know, you can never say love you enough. Uh, I even got a love you more reply from Annie the other day. So I must be doing something a bit right. Uh, the, the other way we normalized intimacy was with hugs. You know, we've, we've always been very purposeful in giving our kids plenty of hugs. And I, and I don't just mean when they're upset or when they're sad, but we just like to give each other hugs. You know, sometimes I'll be passing Joel in the corridor and I'll just give him a hug. Or, or Anya will be making breakfast and I'll attempt to give her a, a big hug. She's kind of at that stage at the moment. You know, what I, what I love now is that they, they do the same back. You know, I'll be working in my office and one of them will just walk in and give me a hug for no other reason than it's just simply an expression of how we love each other in our family. And I love it because it's made us, you know, really, really close. And there is something amazing about the simple act of a hug. You know, in fact, uh, neuroscientists discovered that when you hug someone, your body releases certain hormones that benefit that bonding experience between you and another person. So hugging someone regularly will actually deepen your relationship with them, not just on an emotional level, but on a biomedical level too. You know, it's a powerful action. It's, it's powerful because it's a great example of the power of touch. There is something incredibly profound about our ability to touch and feel it. Think about it for a moment. Can you imagine the world without that sense of touch? Can you imagine not being able to feel the embrace of a loved one as they hug you? Or not being able to feel the movement of a, of a newborn child in your arms? Even just the simple things like being, un, uh, being unable to feel something when you're picking it up, not being able to you know, find your glasses in the morning, uh, or, or know if you are gripping that cup of hot coffee hard enough to, to lift it safely. Our sense of touch is one of the most profound things about the human experience, which is probably why it can also be one of the most controversial. Because just as much as touching can be a good thing, there are plenty of examples today of how touch has, has become a negative thing. You know, what in one scene can indicate a romantic moment between two people as their hands touch across the dinner table, in another moment becomes a cause for concern and an invasion of privacy, or, or worse, an act of abuse. And we live in a society that has plenty of touch issues. There are a lot of reasons today why people might choose, you know, to withhold their ability to touch or or fear being intimate because because we fear being inappropriate or or we've felt the experience of someone being inappropriate to us. And yet God made us with the sense of touch. And he made us that way so that we can experience the intimacy of a hug or the celebration of a slap on the back. And, you know, and so you have to ask, we have to ask the question, is, you know, is what we're suffering with today, is it just another case of you know, cancel culture or, or, or just you know, it's part of a more modern world, the result of an oversensitive, issue-driven generation? And, and yes, in some ways we have become very sensitive in society, but you might be surprised to know that people have struggled with touch issues throughout history. In fact, the story we just read is a great example of this. It is full of touch issues. You know, right at the start of the story, we find Jesus arriving by boat at the shore of a lake called the Sea of Galilee. And, and it's no surprise at this point that we find a huge crowd you know, waiting for him because Jesus has become something of an A-list celebrity. Thanks to the, you know, the word of his teaching, the story of the miracles of healing that's spreading all over the countryside. But then we have two different stories cross paths. The first story is about a a 12-year-old daughter of a guy called Jairus, a local synagogue leader. All we know about this little girl is that she's gravely ill. She's on on the verge of death. Now, we can imagine that her parents would have done everything to try to help her. But for whatever unknown reason to us, she lies at home and at this moment in time is on her deathbed. But then the family must have heard that Jesus is near. They hear something that stirs hope in their hearts. This Jesus who, this miracle worker, this healer has come near. And so the father, Jairus, he races to find Jesus. He pushes through the crowd knowing that, that, you know, here's a man whose very touch brings healing. And and he falls at Jesus' feet and he pleads with him to come. Would you lay your hands on my daughter? Of course, Jesus agrees without question and begins to follow this synagogue leader back to his house. At which point our first story is interjected by the second, the story of a woman who has spent the last 12 years of her life suffering from an uncontrollable bleeding. Now we're told that she spent everything that she has trying to get better, but all that has happened is that she got worse. But even worse than the illness would have been the consequences of her illness. 
because people would have considered her, according to the law of Moses, as unclean. She was literally untouchable. You know, she was untouchable until she had been pronounced clean again by a priest. And the only way to be pronounced clean by a priest would be to present herself to the temple with the proper offering seven days after her bleeding had stopped. But her condition has meant her bleeding has never stopped. And therefore, this woman not only suffered her illness for 12 years, but she'd have been kept at arm's length by all of society. And she's been unable to attend the temple in all that time leaving her not only impoverished through spending all her money on her treatment, but also alone, isolated from community. And she must have, it says that she heard that Jesus was here. You know, she's heard, overheard someone in the streets and hope begins to stir in her heart, which is the part of the story that gives us our first touch issue. Because this was a woman with an unacceptable condition, according to the law. You know, most of the law of Moses that had been given to, to help and it was given to help and protect the people, to help, you know, to help them do life well. But the religious leaders over generations had perverted and corrupted the instructions that God had given the people and used it as a means to control. So what had meant to be, you know, what was meant to be about good hygiene and protecting people's health and, and, and fostering community had become a reason to separate clean from unclean. So a society that should have seen this woman as someone who, who needed their help, who needed their love and care, was now intolerant of her condition because of the inconvenience and cost it would incur to touch her. See, just touching her would have caused others to be considered as unclean themselves, and therefore they would have to go through a ceremonial washing process in order to be clean again. Which means her first problem was having to push through a crowd in order to get near Jesus. She didn't have to touch a lot of people. And if anyone noticed her, there would have been an uproar. What she was doing was completely unacceptable because she herself was considered unacceptable. This woman also had a, prob- a second problem, a-, a second touch issue. And it was the fact that it was, no- it was also taboo at this point in time for a woman to touch a man in public. What she was intending in her heart to do could cause great offense. For her to get her healing, she was going to have to expose herself to that to a very public backlash that could leave her healed but still grieved, whole but still suffering. Yet her suffering was so great she decides that it's worth the risk. She thinks to herself, if I can just touch the edge of his cloak, that'll be enough. I love this because I just think this woman had such a faith that she expected the very least from Jesus would be enough for for her. So she presses through the crowd until she sees the cloak of Jesus with an arm's reach. She reaches out, she touches his cloak, and then bang, she feels the power, a healing power flow through her body, and she's instantly healed. Which would have been a great end for her in that moment. She would have been very happy, just saying, great, let's go. But of course, Jesus noticed. <laughs> you know, Jesus turns around, he asks the question, who touched my clothes? Which seemed ridiculous because everyone was touching him. You know, In fact, the disciples at this point, you know, pointing out to Jesus, say, how can you ask that? How can you ask who touched me? Everyone is touching you. But his response is to keep looking for the person who touched him. He keeps looking, he searches. Eventually, this woman comes forward and and confesses in fear in her voice. She must have been able, you know, she, she must have been able to feel the eyes of the crowd burning into her as she, you know, began to real, as they began to realize who this woman was and what she'd done. But I love Jesus' reply. He doesn't lecture the woman on why she, you know, what she's done is unacceptable or get offended at the social taboo that she's just broken. Instead, he calls her daughter. He speaks to her with the love of the Father and he says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I mean, it's a beautiful moment. It's such a merciful miracle. Then in the very next breath, tragedy strikes. We learn that the other daughter from our first story has died. Seeing the fear on Jairus' face, Jesus says to them, don't be afraid, just believe. And they head to the house, they kick out the hired mourners who were, you know, who just laughed in Jesus' face when he declared that the girl was asleep. And and they go into the room where the girl is lying dead. And, And this is where we have the third touch issue, because this is a room filled with death. This is a room filled with hopes, dreams that have been shattered. And it's a touch issue because another law from the Old Testament says that touching a dead body will make you unclean. And, and so you would have to go and present yourself and offerings and ceremonial washing and all of that. But even more so, priests were told to not even enter the room of a dead body unless it was a close relative. 
And even then, if you were the high priest, even that wasn't allowed. And yet here we have Jesus, the heavenly high priest himself, entering the room of a dead 12-year-old girl. He takes a hand in his, he touches a lifeless body, and he commands life to return. And all of a sudden, the room that was full of death burst into new life. The little girl that was dead wakes up from her sleep and begins walking around. She's healed, she's alive, and she's apparently hungry because Jesus says, get her some food. Two stories, two daughters, both suffering conditions that left one dead and the other as good as dead. Both healed, both restored to life because the power and love of Jesus is not restricted or offended by our touch issues. Church, the truth this morning is that we, we've all got issues that want to keep us from encountering the life and the healing that Jesus brings. And yet Jesus steps through the lies of the devil and what the world would say to us this morning and he reaches out his hand to take our hand in his and he says, it's time to get up. It's time to live again. Because here's, here's the truth. The touch of Jesus is a touch that accepts, accepts. You know, to the woman with an unacceptable health condition, he responded to her as a father who loves a daughter. You know, to the daughter who lay dead, who had become unclean, he, he allowed himself to become unclean on her behalf. He, he took her death and gave her life. What we see as unacceptable, Jesus sees as an opportunity to show the full extent of his love. The problem we have is that we all, we all have a need for acceptance. We, we all desire affirmation and love. But in our search for the fulfillment of our need, we end up looking for acceptance and affirmation from, from all the wrong people, all the wrong situations. You know, we find ourselves endlessly scrolling for it, endlessly yearning for that one like or that one comment that will turn everything around. And before long, it feels like we are bleeding life. We end up feeling dead on the inside and therefore we begin to walk through life. We carry that death with us. We carry that lack of acceptance, that, sh- that sense of shame. And it, and it touches and it, and it ruins every relationship we try to make, including our relationship with God. I mean, why would God accept me? Why would God love me? Church, don't let the devil tell you that you are somehow unacceptable to come into his presence today. Don't let him tell you that God's attention must surely be on someone else, on, on those who are far more holy than you, far more blessed, far better at taking selfies, because the reality is that Jesus is hunting through the crowd and he's looking for you. And he won't stop until he's found you. And he won't rest until he has your full attention. And when he has your full attention, his words are full of affirmation. He knows you by a name that transforms everything. He knows you as a child of God. You are known to him as son, daughter. See, Jesus doesn't just accept you, he adopts you. We have been adopted into his family. We are welcomed into his presence by grace. We are received with open arms by the one who does not withhold his power to heal us. Just one touch from Jesus is enough to satisfy the need for a million likes because his is a touch that accepts us completely. It's also a touch that cancels the offense. You know, the woman had got her healing. Jesus could have left it at that, but instead he made sure to publicly acknowledge her. He he called her daughter and he sent her away in peace so that no one could accuse her of wrongdoing, of, of any offense. Any offense she had caused was canceled out because we're not just accepted for who we are, but Jesus cancels out the offense of the person that we were or we think we were. He took all our sin All our offences on the cross. He became the offence to God on our behalf, paying that price for our sins that we would no longer be slaves to it. You know, Romans 6 verse 6 puts it this way. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Don't let the devil accuse you this morning of the offences and the sins of your past. Don't let what happened yesterday keep you from what God has got for you today. Because when we receive the new life that Jesus gives us, the old life is gone. He gives us a brand new life. All it takes is one touch of his grace. One touch is enough to cancel every offense. It's enough to wipe away years of pain and suffering and to fill you with a peace that transcends all understanding. Jesus has dealt with the offense that we might know the full acceptance and mercy of our heavenly father who reaches out to us as his children. Jesus has a touch that cancels offense. 
And it's also a touch that resurrects your future. You know, you might have woken up today feeling like your life is dead. The lights are out. What else is there to live for? Or or maybe you feel lost, wondering about your future. What, What could God do with me anyway? Maybe you've come on here today with dreams that have been shattered by events outside of your control or, you know, hope that's taken so long. You've had something that you've been believing for to come to pass and yet it just feels dead now and forgotten. I love that Jesus doesn't just heal the woman, but he speaks to her future when he says, go in peace and suffer no more. I love that Jesus walks into that room full of shattered dreams, a room filled with death, and he brings resurrection. Jesus wants to bring resurrection to you today. Jesus has the power to resurrect that future that you thought was dead. He wants to breathe new life into you. He wants to speak fresh hope over you. He is willing to enter into your place of death and touch your life with his resurrection power. He will overcome the touch issues that we think will keep him away. He steps into the darkness of where we found ourselves and he brings light and he brings hope. You know, all it takes this morning is one touch from the one whose very word can calm the storms, whose authority casts out the devil and whose very touch brings new life and new hope. You know, will you allow yourself to be touched by Jesus today? Will you be like uh, Jairus who heard that Jesus is near and go out of your way to find him, to hunt him down, to, to come before Jesus and bring your needs to him, allowing his touch to bring healing? Or will you be like that woman with the issue of blood who spent 12 years of her life trying to find the answers, finally knowing that Jesus is near? She put all fear, all of the things that society had said about her aside. And she pressed in just one touch with Jesus, knowing that one touch of Jesus was all that she needed. If that's you today, I encourage you, reach out and allow the touch of Jesus to cancel the offense, to bring complete acceptance, and more importantly, to bring resurrection to whatever issue or death is in your life today. Let let Jesus bring resurrection and the life to you today. Come on, let me finish with prayer. Father God, we thank you today for that touch of life. We thank you today that the gospel is about you giving your life for us, that we might know life and life everlasting. And so we reach up to you today and we receive you and we thank you and we worship you as Lord and our God. Lord, we establish you as King over our life. We know that you are our healer, you are our provider. There is no one else. We look to no one else. Help us to put aside the things of this world and to focus completely on you. And just, Lord, where there is need today, where there's healing or where there's a resurrection that's needed, where there's hope, shattered dreams. Um, Lord, we pray, would you come into those moments right now to everyone listening and would you breathe fresh life in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I confess I've been a criminal I've stolen your breath And I've sang my own song Lord, I confess That I'm far from innocent These shackles I wear Oh, I'm brought on my own The scarlet sins had a crimson cost Nailed my death to that old rugged cross An empty slave had an empty grave Thank God that storm was rolled I confess I've 
I've been a prodigal Made for your house But I walked on my roads Then Jesus came He sought out my prison walls Death came to life When he called me by name Scarlet sins had a crimson cost And my death's that old rugged cross Empty slate and an empty grave Thank God that stone was a rose The scarlet sins had a crimson cost Nailed my death to that old rugged cross Empty slate and an empty grave Thank God that stone was a rose I see bright prints and crows Tramped over the ashes A wide open tomb Where there should be a casket The children are singing, dancing, and laughing The Father is welcoming This is our homecoming Roses and blooms Pushed off from the ashes Our rivers of tears Fell from good times remain are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. Oh, this is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glory sound and the great clouds of witnesses all gather round. Cause the ones that were lost are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. The scarlet Should be a casket. The children are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom pushed up from the embers. Our rivers of tears flow from good times remembered. Families are singing and laughing and dancing. 
Father is welcome. Great. Well, I really hope this message has helped you today. If you would like prayer, maybe if you're responding and you're wanting to become a follower, a disciple of Jesus, and you want to know what the next steps are, um, or you just got some questions that you want to ask, or give us some feedback on what's been happening in your world, head to our connection point, head to c3yorks.church slash connect, and you can do all of that there. Uh, in the meantime, you know, if you are in the Leeds and the York area, we do have uh, in-person services happening every Sunday, 10.30. Check out the website. We'd love to see you and make you feel completely at home and welcome. And, uh, and as a final act of worship, let's bring our tithes and offerings. So for those of you who are regular watchers, uh, part of the church, we, we encourage you, let's bring our tithes right now. Let's bring on offering. And uh, all the details to give are on the screen that you can give by give directly from your bank or through our online. And as, as always, we're so grateful for your generosity in supporting the work and the ministry that we do. Uh, this is, but also, this is an act of worship. It's our opportunity to say to God that we trust Him and completely in every part of our life. So, thanks for that. The details are stay on the screen. Uh, in the meantime, our series, uh, the questions Jesus asked, is going to continue. Next week, we've got Alex Pitcher, who will be sharing a message. Uh, in the, but before then, have a fantastic week and uh, look after yourself. I hope to see you soon. God bless.